For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Maybe one of the most challenging teachings of the Bible is the one that we often refer to as righteousness by faith. In theological circles, its technical term is soteriology, which simply means how a person obtains salvation. It's something that Aventist, the Adventist Church has had to grapple with, perhaps for several decades. Um, and more specifically, with the 1888 General Conference session back in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so when someone pointed out to me that the Ten Commandments, as given in Exodus chapter 20, does not begin with, you shall have no other gods before me, but with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, it confirms something that I had known for quite some time. God does the saving. The obedience part comes as a result of what he's done for us, not as a contributing factor to our salvation. And in my opinion, this one truth alone ought to move us to the very core of our being, especially when we take the time to consider seriously what the Lord had to go, had to do or had to go through to make salvation a possibility. When the Bible refers to it as the gospel or good news, it wasn't kidding. There can be nothing in this world or even throughout the entire universe that will ever equal, or as the song says, the blessing that our salvation brings. But it came at a horrific price to our God and Savior. But guess what? He thought that you were worth it. He thought that I was worth it. So my question for us today is, how do we respond to this magnanimous expression of love as seen in the sacrifice of God's dear Son? Is there something that you and I can do, not as an attempt to help God save us, but as an expression of appreciation for all that he has invested in our present and future well-being? If the Apostle Paul would have it his way, he would probably point us to the first verse in Hebrews chapter 12, where you remember we saw it last week in, our, in, our, in my message. He said, I beseech you, brethren, therefore. What does he mean, therefore? He says, in light of what God went through, in light of all that he's invested, in light of all that he suffered and spent for you and for me, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Another way you could say it would be, it's the least that we should be willing to do. After all he's done, how can we ignore it and walk away? We saw last week what he meant by our reasonable service. He was talking about an act of worship. That's what you do when you serve the Lord. It isn't just about praying and, and uh, uh, singing hymns or listening to a sermon, but worship is actually the life that you live. How do you live your life and how does it glorify God? So we spent every evening, the last 10 days, we've spent every evening studying the critical importance of spending time every day in a state of worship. Now, whether it be in your closet by yourself or corporately as a, as a church or, or as a, a, a family unit in your individual homes, it's more than just this. It's by this kind of activity that we maintain our connection with Christ and strengthen the relationship that we ought to have with him. In ancient Israel, they had the, uh, a term for this. We all already brought it up in the baby dedication, but it was called the, the Shema. The Shema is actually, Shema is, is, is the Hebrew word for hear. Listen, listen. And this is what it says to us. Shema 
Israel, Adonai Elihenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is God. And then it goes on to say, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them on your, as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts and on, of your house and on the gates. In other words, basically it's saying is that you need to immerse yourself, you need to immerse your family, your children, your, your, your spouses, everybody in the knowledge of the Lord, in knowing him the way he deserves to be known. We're told in Testimonies, volume 5, page two, 328, paragraph 3, it says, here are positive directions that reach down to our time. God is speaking to us in these last days. He wasn't just speaking to Moses and the people who were in the wilderness thousands of years ago. He's speaking to you and to me today, and he will be understood and obeyed. We find in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, uh, you know, back then they basically had the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And there they were given their instructions on how to serve the Lord the way he wants us to learn to serve him. And he says, it says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it how often? Day and night, all the time. So that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Who wants to be prosperous? Can I see your hand? Oh, come on now. I know you all want to be prosperous. And then it says you will have good success. When you and I take the time to worship God to whom we owe everything, it's important that we do so in a meaningful way. Too often we have a tendency to rush through as, it, as if it were a burden that we need to discard, to get it out of the way so that we can move and get, really start living with more important things, but that's not the way it is. Not if you really want to be happy, no sir. I'm reminded of one of the better stories in the Bible. If you'll turn with me to John chapter four, the Gospel of John. Um, I want you to turn there because well, you know the story, but I'm going to share it anyway. On the odd occasion, Jesus and his disciples who had passed through Samaria on their way to either to Judea or they were going back to Galilee, this happened to be one of those occasions. And when they got to the well, Jacob's well, you know what I mean? This is almost near, just outside of the city of Sychar. Jesus decided to rest there. And so he sent his disciples in town to get some food and he would stay there and just rest a while. And as he was there, this lady came up. She was coming with her big jar because she was going to get water from the well. And um, he did something that was completely out of character, at least for most Jewish men. He asked for a drink of water. And uh, you can just imagine, she was taken by surprise. Like, who is he? What is he doing here? Look at verse 9, if you look at chapter 4, John chapter 4, verse 9, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, and much less Samaritan women. But Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so began a rather interesting exchange of words. As you can well imagine, Jesus never let an opportunity go by where he was going to be able to reach out and somehow touch a soul. And it didn't matter whether it were Jews or Gentiles or Samaritans or whatever they were, they were all precious in his sight. And so he begins to share with her. It's like in Luke chapter 19, it says he came to seek and to save that, that which was lost. If you're lost, he's coming, he came looking for you. Anybody, anybody. In verse 13, Jesus, uh, it continues, Jesus answered and said to her, 
Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the waters that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And when the woman heard this, she said, Sir, I, uh, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now, we don't know at this point whether she really meant when she said whether she actually believed his words or whether she was just playing along just to see how this stranger would work things out here, how he would respond to her request. And as they say, now the ball was now in his court. What's he going to say? How's he going to explain exactly what he just told her? And I suspect she almost wished that she hadn't been so smart with her question. Because now the stranger moved the conversation in a direction that she wished he had not. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not even your husband. In that, you spoke truly. It's kind of interesting how after hearing this, the Spirit's convicting power compelled her to admit to the stranger that he had to be more than just a Jew. He must have been a prophet or something. But even then, she wasn't prepared to discuss her personal life with him. And so she diverts the conversation to some, somewhere else. In verse 20, our, she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where we ought to, ought to worship. You might say at this juncture that we've come to the, right back to the point of my sermon. Jesus goes along with the change of subject, and he shares with her a truth about God's kingdom that we would do well to take heed. It has to do with worship. In verse 21, he says to her, woman, believe me, Yahweh is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. Why? Because salvation is of the Jews. It was given to the Jews to share with the rest of the world. We know. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What would you say Jesus meant by those words? What was he getting at? Where was he going with this? What does it mean to worship in spirit, in truth? You know, we have ample examples in the Bible of people who worshiped in a way that, well, falls terribly short of the ideal of what God had in mind. For example, if you turn to Luke 18, it's just a few pages behind, back. If you go to Luke chapter 18, we have a wonderful example. And uh, in verse 9, it says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Thank God for people who feel a need to worship, who feel a need to pray. It's what you do when you take the time to come in the house of the Lord and worship. And in this case, we're given an example of what is acceptable and what is not so acceptable. If you look at verse 11, the Pharisee, he stands up first. He stands, he's, he's a worshiper, he's a leader of the church. And he stands and he prays thus with himself. Now there's your first hint. Who's he praying to? Because he's talking to himself. <laughs> is he praying to God or to himself? Anyway, just a play on words, I guess. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Have you ever done that? Extortioners. Unjust. Adulterers. Or even as this 
this tax collector over there. No, I'm not like him, no sir. No, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. You know, we talked a lot about tithes in the last little while. Tithes are a good thing. If it wasn't for tithes, my life would be poor because for, or for lack of it. I praise God for what he's done for me because I've chosen to believe him and to trust him. But here he is doing all of these things and he thinks that he's a good man. Look at me, look at me. I'm not like that tax collector. And you guess that this is not exactly what God had in mind for this man. Why? Because it had nothing to do with the man's concern for God or for God's will in his life. It was all about himself. And besides that, he was comparing himself with other men. You remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It is not wise to compare yourself with someone else and say, oh, I'm better than he is or she is because I do this or I do that. That is nonsense. God, he felt no need of God. He was doing quite okay all on his own or so he thought. He operated on his own steam and didn't recognize the sinful state that he was actually in. And when the Pharisees complained that Jesus ate and drank and with tax collectors and sinners, you remember that, that experience? He was sitting there with them and they came, the, the rulers came about and they said, what is he doing eating with those guys? They're tax collectors, they're sinners and so forth. And you remember how Jesus turned around and he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those that are sick. I have not come to gather the righteous, you who think you're so good. I've come to save sinners, to heal sinners and lead them to repentance. In chapter, uh, verse 13, it goes on, but the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but instead he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What a contrast of attitude. One, thank God I am who I am. And the other one says, God, have mercy. I am a sinner. I have fallen. I have failed. And Jesus ends, he turns around to his disciples and he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When you pause long enough in your busy life to take time to refocus your attention on God, does it remind you of just how badly you need him in your life? Is it to thank him for making you better than the neighbor next door? Or is it because you know from experience your nothingness if it wasn't for him? You know, in Prophets and Kings, page 175, it says nothing, nothing is apparently more helpless and yet really more invincible than the soul that feels his nothingness and relies wholly on God. Now, I want, to, I want to say it again, and I know I've, I've quoted this statement before, but I'm going to say it again because I want you to think about what it's actually saying. Nothing is apparently more helpless and yet more invincible than the soul that feels his nothingness and relies wholly on God. When you recognize your total dependence on God for everything, that's when you become invincible. When you depend on yourself, there's nothing there for you. Trust me, this man's time of worship was of greater value than that of the Pharisee because he recognized and acknowledged his need of God's grace in his life. He needed a righteousness that he did not possess the, the, that only Christ can give. The Pharisee was satisfied with his own righteousness, which, by the way, is defined in the Bible as Nothing more than in Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says that our righteousness is not our bad behavior, not our bad thoughts, but our righteousnesses are filthy rags in the eyes of God. The only righteousness that counts with God is the one only Jesus can give, the righteousness that is by faith, righteousness by faith. One interest will prevail, 
one subject will swallow up us all, uh, will swallow up all Christ, our righteousness. Taking time to worship God, the one who created us, whether in church or a living room or in our closet, is about connecting with the source of all that we have and all that we are. It's about taking time to feed our souls with spiritual food that in the morning will carry us through the day and in the evening will carry us through the night. How goes it with you? What's your connection with Jesus like? In John 17, 3, when Jesus is praying to his Father for his disciples, he says, Father, this is life eternal, that they might know you. What was he saying? In Jesus Christ, whom you have said, this is what life eternal is. Becoming better acquainted with the Lord results in life forevermore. Not just an informal acquaintance, such as whether you know he exists or you're acquainted with some facts about him, but knowing him on a personal level that comes about from spending quality time in intimate communion with him. And so my prayer is that the 10 days we spend together will help bring this about in your life and in mine. But remember, whether this was the beginning of something new for you or you've been doing this for a long time, what's important is that we hold tight to the Lord. He is our righteousness. He is our strength. He is our everything. He deserves our worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being everything to us. We're thankful that you give every breath we take is a gift from above. Every beat of our heart comes from you. Everything we do, every thought we think, everything that happens in our lives, Lord, every blessing comes from above. And we just want to bow before you, worship you, recognize who you are and how deserving you are of our total surrender to you. And so come, Father, and fill us with your spirit and move us as you see fit, because you certainly deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.